we showed you this page from Democratic Virginia Governor Ralph Northam's medical school yearbook page from 1984, when he was 25 years old. Since it surfaced, pretty much every Democratic office holder in Virginia has called on Northam to resign. The calls for his resignation, including the two Democratic senators from Virginia and all the announced impossible 2020 Democratic presidential candidates, accelerated after he first apologized for being one of the two people in the racist photo and then said, mm -mm, no, he wasn't that person. It wasn't me, the shaggy defense, right? He reversed himself on the photos at the disastrous live news conference. Take a look. When my staff showed me the photo in question yesterday, I was seeing it for the first time. I did not purchase the EVMS yearbook, and I was unaware of what was on my page. When I was confronted with the images yesterday, I was appalled that they appeared on my page, but I believe then and now that I am not either of the people in that photo. I stand by my statement of apology to the many Virginians who were hurt by seeing this content on a yearbook page that belongs to me. It is disgusting. It is offensive. It is racist. And it was my responsibility to recognize and prevent it from being published in the first place. My belief that I did not wear that costume or attend that party stems in part from my clear memory of other mistakes I made in the same period of my life. That same year, I did participate in a dance contest in San Antonio, in which I darkened my face as part of a Michael Jackson costume. I look back now and regret that I did not understand the harmful legacy of an action like that. It is because my memory of that episode is so vivid that I truly do not believe I am in the picture in my yearbook. And you, you said that the competition in San Antonio was a dance competition? Yes. And it was that you danced the moonwalk? That's right. Are you still able to moonwalk? Uh, <clears throat> inappropriate circumstances. My wife says inappropriate circumstances. <laughs> A new poll conducted after the picture surfaced showed Nathan's net approval rating plummet. CNN is reporting that, according to a source at Nathan's cabinet meeting this morning, that the governor specifically said that if he resigns, he would be resigning as a racist for life. That he wants to stay in office and convince people that he is not in that photo. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, and that the photo does not represent who he is. While all this was going on late yesterday, an allegation of sexual assault surfaced against Lieutenant Governor Justice Fair Justin Fairfax. A woman claimed he sexually assaulted her in the 2004 Democratic National Convention in Boston. Fairfax put out a statement at 2.55 a.m. this morning denying it. And late this afternoon, he held an impromptu news conference at the Virginia Capitol building and said these allegations were timed to smear him as he may become Virginia's governor if Governor Ralph Northam resigns. Uh, and my family uh, is strong. Uh, my faith is incredibly strong. Uh, my faith in God uh, is unshaken. Uh, we will not only deal with this uh, smear as we've dealt with so many other attacks over time, uh, but we've always, uh, when we've been attacked, uh, been elevated. Uh, every single time someone is attacked, whether it's a lie, uh, whether it's a smear, a political attack, a personal attack, a character attack, a character assassination attempt, uh, we've always not only gotten through it, but we have been elevated. Uh, and I, my faith in God is so strong, uh, and I know uh, that the facts uh, will show exactly uh, what we have borne out. How would you describe the relationship? How would you describe the relationship? What, what was the relationship? What relationship? With, the woman. with, with this woman? Uh, someone who I met uh, in 2004 uh, at the Democratic uh, National Convention, and as I mentioned, uh, I told all this to the Washington Post at the time, uh, a year ago, uh, and there's not one fact uh, that I gave to them uh, that they were able to contradict. Can you tell us what happened? Uh, what is it? Sure, sure. I met her uh, at the convention. Uh, we met and uh, you know talked, and I did not know her prior to. Um, I was 25 years old, unmarried, uh, a campaign staffer uh, at the time, and uh, we hit it off. She was uh, you know, very interested in me, and uh, and so eventually at one point uh, we ended up going uh, to uh, my hotel room. Uh, this is in 2004. Uh, she was, you know, very uh, much into um, the uh, consensual encounter, and she even admits in the story there's a uh, consensual uh, activity going on. And again, I have children, so I'm going to be very circumspect uh, about what I say. Um, but but everything was 100% consensual, and not only that, uh, the same uh, person 
uh, called me uh, sometime later and wanted to meet with me, wanted to come visit me. Uh, I was still in law school, at Columbia Law School, wanted to come to New York City to meet with me, wanted me to meet her mother, uh, and said that years later, uh, I'm sorry, months later in this case, uh, and years later now, uh, we have a totally fabricated story uh, out of the blue that's meant to attack me uh, because of where I am in politics. The fact that it only came uh, up once I won. Uh, and remember, I have run for office before. Uh, I ran in 2013 in a primary statewide. Uh, I ran in 2017 in a primary statewide. Uh, I ran, of course, in the general and won. It was only at the point uh, that I won uh, that this person uh, fabricates this claim uh, and then attempts to, again, get it into the media. And when they fail the first time, uh, to get it into the media, uh, comes back around uh, a year later at another point of maximum media attention and once again tries to get it in uh, through uh, you know, some website and some people who we know who are uh, involved in this. And so no one who is telling the truth operates in that way. Uh, I have nothing to hide and, and yet to have someone manipulate the media. If you were telling the truth, there's no reason that you would go away for a year once you fail to get it into the Washington Post. Uh, and then come back later again with zero cooperation whatsoever, and there's no cooperation because that did not happen. Our collective PACs are collective PAC. They said that uh, you believe that the governor's team is spreading misinformation about your team. Can you comment on that, please, sir? Uh, the collective PAC has you know, made its statement, uh, and so you believe it. Do you, you know, I, I don't know uh, precisely where this is coming from. I, you know, we've heard uh, different things, but but here's the thing: uh, Does anybody think it's any coincidence that on the eve? Uh, of potentially uh, my being elevated, that that's when this uncorroborated smear comes out. Does anybody believe that's a coincidence? Uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody believes that's a coincidence. Again, particularly with something, this was not the first time this was uh, brought up. It was a year ago uh, this was brought up. Uh, you know, and, and yet, the Post who investigated it for three months dropped the story, did not do it, and they did not do it because it was uncorroborated, and it's uncorroborated because it's not true. And so it goes away uh, for a year, and it crops back up right at this moment. Uh, you don't have to be uh, cynical, uh, you don't have to understand politics uh, to understand when someone's trying to manipulate uh, a process to, uh, to harm someone's character without any basis whatsoever. Uh, and again, uh, I have lived my life uh, in, in, in a way that I'm proud of. Uh, I've put myself up for election to the people of Commonwealth of Virginia multiple times. Uh, you never in the course of any campaign I have ever run uh, had anything uh, said uh, like this uh, about me. Uh, and again, I'm someone who uh, grew up uh, in, a, in a tough environment, Northeast Washington, D.C., uh, but because people invested in me, I went to Duke University, Columbia Law School, I was in the Law Review of Columbia, uh, I was a federal prosecutor, I have been through two FBI background checks in my life, I got a top secret security clearance, uh, and I have been an attorney, a federal prosecutor, uh, and now I'm a, a partner in a law firm and sitting as the Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth this, of Virginia. Can you uh, take no note, that's how you communicate clearly during a press conference. So as you heard, Lieutenant Governor Fairfax was asked about the Collective PAC and joined us. Uh, joining us is Quentin James, co-founder of the Collective PAC, an organization that supports black candidates, and Philip Thompson, uh, the president of the Loudoun County NAACP. Let's first go to Quentin. How are you doing this evening, Quentin? I'm good. Thank you so much for, for having me. And uh, it's been a wild 72 hours. Oh, I can only imagine. Thanks so much for joining us. So I think I'll start off with that last point that was raised in the press conference. Could you tell us more about this allegation that perhaps this specific uh, sexual assault allegation has creeped back up as a result of the Northam side of the political um, aisle? Yeah, so uh, listen, we were tipped off uh, on late Saturday evening and early Sunday morning uh, about an attempted whisper campaign from uh, the the Northam team. Now, we don't know who on his team uh, was doing this, but they were raising questions about Justin's age and readiness uh, to serve as governor should Governor Northam resign. Um, that came out about 2.30 p.m. on Sunday, uh, but also because we know where the original picture came from on Friday, uh, we were very worried about, or wary, excuse me, about uh, a white supremacist blog, obviously not wanting to see an uh, African-American uh, like Justin Fairfax become a successful governor of Virginia. And so we put, uh, you know, a call out to folks to uh, be ready um, for any lies, uh, any uh, other distractions that would have, you know, been coming out. And little to our knowledge, at midnight uh, on uh, Sunday uh, evening and, and, and Monday morning, uh, that same white supremacist blog uh, releases a Facebook post from uh, the accuser, which was shared to them um, by what we are 
investigating what we believe to be uh, a very prominent and public uh, Democratic and liberal uh, couple um, from the Richmond area. And so we are unsure uh, who they are connected to. We know that uh, the woman who shared the accuser's Facebook post is uh, the wife of a uh, professor at the University of Richmond who also uh, worked for uh, two Democratic mayors in Richmond um, over the past few years. And so there is some concern around why would uh, this reputable uh, couple uh, use this situation, right, this potential Me Too situation, and go to a white supremacist news outlet or blog with that information and not the Post or not the Times or many of the other reputable news sources. Mm -hmm. uh, come mm -hmm. to find out at 3 a.m., uh, you know, yesterday that this went to the Post and they decided that it couldn't be corroborated, so they didn't uh, publish it. So now this is all kind of you know, getting out there, conservative media jumping all over it. But we have a lot of questions about where did this come from um, and, and who is kind of manipulating this process behind the scenes using uh, the veil of this white supremacist blog as like them breaking this news. And that's not where it came from. So we're that's looking a, into that. That's a very important question I and mean, a very good question. Uh, I want to bring in Philip on this. Uh, what's your thoughts about where this came from? Does it seem plausible that this would have come from Democrats who are in, in essence trying to protect Northam? Well, you know, it, it, the delay process, if you look at how this all happened, he was going to resign mm -hmm. and, and have indications. And then all of a sudden he has this meeting with these operatives of his and they start delaying. Mm -hmm. And as they delay, then this comes out. So it's a, it's a perfect tactic to try to delay the, what's going on with you and then let this other stuff come out. And where, if it's messy enough, then either everybody will say, oh, well, let's just leave it alone. Absolutely. And you're sort of seeing that now with, with, with some of the people in the House saying, oh, we're not, there's no stomach for, for, for impeaching him and all these various things. So mm -hmm. now it's gotten a little bit messy. If before, if it was just Justin in, in this clean slate, I think, I think things would have went a lot different. Yeah, I mean, when I think back even to the campaign, for example, I ha I'm a Virginia resident. I, I happen to remember the controversy about the Northam campaign basically copying some Democratic Party literature. The literature was copied word for word. It included a picture of Northam. It included a picture of uh, Fairfax. It included a, a picture of the attorney general candidate at the time, who's also white, right? But somehow, when Northam's campaign got a hold of it, the black guy's picture got erased. I mean, do, are we seeing some consistency here? Yeah, you know, we were ready for that. Uh, those of us work closely with Justin, and that's why I ended up in the Washington Post and New York Times really quick, hit them hard. They then jumped away from that. So you're starting to see the impact of that, of that same type of technique. You know, Virginia is, as I, as I say it, Virginia politics, especially Democrat politics, is somewhat of a plantation. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to preside on this plantation but you're not going to you're not going to get to the big house seats. That's the way they try to handle it. And in this situation, they are staring at the precipice of having a 39 year old man become a, a potentially a governor for six years. And for some people, that's that's probably untenable. I hear you. So joining us on the panel today to talk about this and more is Joseph Williams, senior editor for U.S. News and World Reports, Michael Brown, former vice chair of the DNC Finance Committee, and of course Eugene Craig of the of X Factor Strategies. Yes. <laughs> so welcome. Appreciate it, appreciate it. Great to have you on the panel. So first, I'd love your views on this. What do you think is going on here? Are, are we sort of being too conspiratorial when we talk about, hey, maybe this is coming from the Democrats? It's hard to be too conspiratorial when you're talking about Virginia politics for the reasons <laughs> you just said. I mean, um, I'm old enough to remember when Doug Wilder was uh, elected yep. in, uh, in the 80s. And on the eve of his election, when it looked like he had scored a clear victory, all of a sudden there was a recount, all of a sudden there were problems, there were uh, malfunctions with machine X or machine Y, this precinct wasn't counted accurately. So it's not surprising at all. What is interesting is that it's coming from the left, ostensibly. And there's been a lot of discussion about this, and to me it kind of smacks a little bit of liberal racism, where you have people who want to be on the right side but still can't quite give up that measure of, of, of white supremacy or mm -hmm. of superiority. They want to be in charge. They don't want any other people to be in charge. Even though they have good intentions, just trust us. Yeah. But I think right now it's, it's, it's a situation where you have to wonder if Governor Northam was lying then or if he's lying now. His credibility is dust. And even if he wasn't in that photograph, it still is a really bad look to kind of say, well, I wore blackface once on a moonwalk and I should still get to be the governor. Even the once thing doesn't hold water to me. 
because when he specifically said, well, you know, if you ever did off. this before, <laughs> that you know, it's hard to get yeah. too much off. So I didn't put too much, much on. on. And you don't know that if that's your first time using it. Exactly. Uh, but, but what are your thoughts about this? I, I agree 100% with you. I mean, the, the record that he's... That's, a, that's become public in the last 72 hours between the blackface that now we know isn't the first time. You know, he's now in a Super Saiyan Coon Man. You know, that's your <laughs> nickname. You know, that, that, that right there should disqualify you. I mean, okay, yes. the picture. All right, where do you get a KKK robe? In 1984. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, would, did he just cross KKK? Like, where did like, I'm being honest here. Like, like, cleaners, you know, with, like, yeah, you <laughs> know, like, we're, we're, like, you just don't, you know, come across those just, you know, willy nilly, you know, at your local Goodwill. Well, I can you tell know? you, I was actually a student at Virginia State University in the 1980s. And Did while you come I was a KKK road? When, while I was at Virginia State University, there was actually a Klan march right by our campus oh. where there were plenty of KKK robes. Got it. So it is not it, to me. It is. It is. Quite frankly, it looks pretty damn authentic yeah. to me. But, well, but, you're also, but, but, you're also talking about the cap, the former capital of the Confederacy. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true, that's I mean, true. You're talking about that is not in short supply, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. But also you've got the, the, the governor who was also mired in this campaign over the Confederate statues. Mm -hmm. The governor, the uh, mayor of Richmond is African American. He was mired in it. Yeah. And you have this struggle for history. Yeah. The struggle who, who gets to decide history yeah. and who gets to say what's racist and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And to a lot of people's sentiment, it's not the white guy. He Absolutely. Get to do that. Yeah. I hear you. So, Michael. Uh, being someone who's familiar with breaking barriers, right? Do you think it was just too much for people to bear hearing basically 24 whole hours of people having these thoughts about the second black governor uh, in Virginia, the f youngest black, the youngest governor ever in this nation? Do you think that was itself, all of that discussion, that chatter was rubbing people the wrong way? I mean, possibly, just like uh, it was too much for after eight years of an African-American president and possibly a woman. Mm -hmm. um, just like, so yes, yeah, sometimes, it, but you know what? Some of that doesn't even matter. Whether the lieutenant governor is black, yellow, green, or white, um, this guy needs to step down, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. Steve King needs to step down. I didn't hear Majority Leader McCarthy talking about leave uh, the House, yeah. for him to take him off some committees. Right. I didn't hear anybody saying for him to resign. I certainly haven't heard any from the right telling President Trump, sorry, 45 to resign. Oh, look at you. I slipped. I slipped. I slipped. Oh, man. So, so, so I, it, it's just, it's terrible. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. He needs to step down, leave office. He has no more, there's no moral equivalent. Yeah, maybe there's some conspiracy theories. It doesn't really matter. He needs to move on. Yeah, Quentin, it's Quentin's still available. I just had a question for him. Quentin, when, mm -hmm. when, when you're looking at what now Governor... I'm call, already calling him Governor Fairfax, uh, is facing. Um, you know, what does this do in terms of damaging potentially his ability uh, to be able to maybe not only just ascend to the governorship if for some reason Northam actually does get his senses and resigns? What mm -hmm. does this mean in, ter mean in terms of his implications with regards to his ability to govern once he's in that space? Has his reputation, has his credibility in some sense been irreparably damaged? Uh, so I think you raise a, a great question. And I think first we need to understand that these are two separate situations. Um, Ralph Northam should resign immediately. Uh, that has no bearing on uh, any uh, falsehoods that have been uh, released to the public over the past uh, 24 to 48 hours. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, the Washington Post and WUSA uh, 9 in the D.C. area uh, have both published accounts that they could not corroborate this story. Mm -hmm. um, and so if the story is not corroborated. I don't think there's anything to really talk about there um, at the moment. Now, if things come forth uh, that could you know, corroborate the story, sure, uh, we could have that conversation. But again, this is a non-corroborated story. It's like me saying, you know, uh, Ralph Northam did something, right? Without any evidence or any additional information there, it's just a falsehood. Uh -huh. um, and so lastly, I think we need to look at Justin's record as a public servant over the past year, um, his time as a federal prosecutor. Uh, you know, he has always performed and served the public very well. And so uh, I don't think this is uh, damaging his reputation uh, for the long haul. Um, I think uh, when you have truth on your side, uh, you know, what will come out will be in your benefit. And so I think this will take some time to, I think, deal with in the public sphere. Um, but I think it's just really important that, one, these are two separate uh, issues. And in uh, a second, um, the story is, is not corroborated at the moment. Uh.
Well, thank you so much for joining us, and I really appreciate your perspectives on that, Quentin. One last question to Philip. You know, as we wrap up this particular portion of the show, uh, as it relates to this particular issue and the NAACP, you know, what's your plan moving forward to sort of keep the pressure on Northam, number one, but also, number two, perhaps even filling in the role of protecting Fairfax to some degree? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're nonpartisan per se, but this is a, this, the issue that the governor's put us in is, is, is incredible because this, you know, people talk about what happened in 1984. Let's talk about what happened in Halloween just this year. Mm. The, our governor dressed up as a, his favorite governor, which is Governor Brewer, who was a slave owner. Oh, my God. He thought it was great enough. He thought it was okay to dress up as a slave owner in 19, in, uh, 2018. He called NAACP and apologized, just like he tried to call NAACP and apologize for this. So we're looking at that. And then if you look at his policies, his yeah. policies haven't been very pro-African-American mm -hmm. in, in any regard. I, it always irritated whenever I met either Governor Northam or Governor McAuliffe. And the first thing they would say in their defense is for African-Americans, oh, we, we, we got the felons registered. Mm -hmm. Well, my statement back to them was like, we're not all felons. So what else you got? You yeah. know? And then, like that's, our, that's the only issue we have. So this is, be, this is a pattern of behavior that's gone on. And you can say 84, but now we're talking about 2018. <laughs> Governor Northam needs to resign, and regardless if Justin was white, like he said, white, black, purple, pink, we need we need a new we need a new governor. Got you. I hear you. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it.